My journey to uh, begin Pison with David eight years ago now was really uh, a little accidental. My mother was affected by ALS and I saw firsthand how that challenge uh, you know, was very difficult for her. She lost the ability to move her hands, she lost the ability to move, and even small things like quality of life, of like being able to read an e-book, those things went away. And I was thinking about what types of technology would actually possibly be able to help somebody when their world is getting smaller. How can we use technology to be able to increase or allow the same type of uh, things that gave my mother joy to still be able to occur. And I was talking to my MIT friends about it, and then one of them very excitedly told me about David and that I had to meet him. And we had a call just a few days later, and then we met up two weeks later, and we got along very well very quickly. And it became clear we both cared a lot about solving problems for people who were really in need, and that's still what drives us at Python every day. You know, for the longest time, we always seen other competitors and also well, everybody be doing with the EMG, they place on large bulk muscles. And then Dexter told me, hey, look, you know, there's only one type of socially form, socially acceptable form factor. That's a watch, that's a bracelet. And that's where we can get the most data. And that's kind of where we are today. We took what we developed, miniaturized it, and then we want to help everyone who, you know, suffers from neurological diseases. So when Dexter and David reached out to me uh, to consider bringing me on as CEO, I came into the office and I saw the technology and I was just completely blown away. It seems like, still seems like black magic to me. Uh, it absolutely works. And at the time they had uh, this device, military grade wearable that uh, we call Vulcan. And it was deployed in the field with several military operations units. Uh, it's very expensive, it's research grade. We still do research on ALS and other things uh, with the device. And I said, David, tell me what's in it. I'm a 36 year semiconductor industry guy, tell me what's in it. So we did, and I said, you realize that 95% of that stuff is already in a watch. Let's focus on the 5%, right? And instead of making another consumer wearable, let's make all consumer wearables better. So I reached out to friends of mine at SD Microelectronics, who's the number one mobile sensor chip guy in the world. Uh, and they reduced that 5% to a single chip two millimeter by two millimeter, so if you look, it looks like a grain of sand. So it fits economically and it fits physically in a watch. So now we're out licensing watch and wearable companies, so name brands, household brands that you will instantly recognize. And over the course of the next year or two, what you're gonna see is watches and athletic wearables roll out with our neural sensor embedded. So having put a chip in every watch, We've pulled together kind of a dream team of scientists, of engineers, retired professional athletes, retired special forces military personnel. Everybody's focused on the user experience, delivering, enable, you know, bringing that sensor to life, merging it with the traditional cardiovascular sensors, and basically delivering a trusted, valued companion for the user. You can, you can be you know, physically exhausted, but if your mind is clear and focused and ready, you can push yourself to limits that are unheard of. And people have done feats of, of strength and, and, and uh, great things that, that are beyond human comprehension. The, al the alternative is possible too, where you're, you're perfectly trained, like you, are, you have done everything that you can possibly do physically to prepare for this moment. And then when that moment comes, you, you are not able to perform. And it is inexcusable, like no one can, no one can point to a reason why you're not able to perform in that, in that moment or in that, re, or in that arena for that reason, when you've done all this work to physically prepare yourself. And the answer lies in, in your cognitive readiness, like where, where you're at cognitively. And we were never able to quanti quantify that, qualify it or assess it up until this point. With Pison, we have that ability. Yeah, I mean, we all know that in this day and age, the mental health uh, crisis is real. There are, there are things that we have that exist, you know, in terms of therapy and, and self-treatment. Now, we actually have the ability to, to measure the impact of those activities. And also, what is the most impactful for you as a person?
you know so all of a sudden it's been five or six days and you haven't been able to focus at work and you're behind and deadlines are building up and things like that and you don't know why and things are starting to get out of control with Python you're able to measure and monitor this in real time you know daily and see as this is starting to occur but you're also able to implement some um, some interventions along the way that that may help more or less and you can do something test it and try it and if it doesn't help you dramatically you can try something else if you try something you know it really works then it's something you can utilize in your life you know every day going forward yeah so usa prime new england has 33 baseball teams 10 softball teams uh, we've expanded over the over the past couple years um, and, and quite frankly, being able to introduce Python to them has been another add-on value to us uh, that, that people are, are, are loving at this point. Again, for the awareness with the reaction and the go-no-go -no -go test, but not only that, the baseball physical analytic package. Uh, and what's great as a program director is I can have all of my athletes on the dashboard where you can make it a competitive environment within the clubhouse. So for instance, reaction times, you know, we, we've got a leaderboard there and you know, the leader for that week might get a, you know, a Python hoodie sweatshirt. Uh, and, and, and kids love that stuff and it provides another competitive edge within the program. But not only that, it, it's something, again, that's been sought after and, and vetted by a lot of programs. So we're basically the, the uh, early adopter for cognitive wearables on body um, to be able to provide this awareness uh, for our players on, on, on cognition and the mental part of the game. At the big league level, these guys are all talented. Sure, there's slight variations of talent, um, but at the end of the day, the separator for me is the mental side and the cognition and being able to prepare your mind and be in a good mind space so that your body can react and work the way, at, at top performance the way you want it to. And, and the thing with Python is it gives you a tool to be able to do that. It, it, it allows you what we call a readiness test, which is a simple reaction time test to be able to see, compared to your baseline, where am I at today? You know, Am I functioning at, at my top peak mental performance and if I'm not what am I going to do about it right sometimes for me that's more tests like let's go get yourself going it may be a workout it may be a cold plunge it may be a cold shower maybe some caffeine it, it may be some music we've actually found out uh, working with, with some teams one of our college uh, programs that music has been a separator for them for the to kind of light the mind on fire and, and get the body <laughs> to follow that to, to work properly so we didn't really have a tool to measure cognition, um, and now we do with Python. So it's a simple, so it's simple to use too. Just put it on your wrist. It, you know, within 30 seconds, you're getting you're getting data on being able to how quick you can how quick you can react to something, and measure that against where your baseline is, so you know how I'm how I'm functioning right now. You know, that's what makes this so exciting with with the Python wearable is we can now use this to train and put ourselves in position. So when we get out of the field, we're functioning at the highest, both mental, mental and physical levels. Yeah, uh, it's, it's the mental state of our, uh, our students is, is forefront for us. Um, the game is second. We really focus on building humans first and athletes second. Um, a lot of kids now are getting wrapped up in the fact that they are hockey players and that becomes their, their full persona, it becomes their personality, and they can't step outside of that. Whether it's in the classroom, with their friends at home, um, anything off the ice, they're still that hockey player. And it creates this, this anxiety when they're on the ice and not performing, or don't perform at the level that they think they do, that affects them off the ice. Uh, it changes who they are as people. Uh, so we really try to focus on uh, you know, giving these, these kids the lessons you know, off the ice that you're a person too. You know, your anxiety comes from a, somewhere, and let's identify where that's from. Um, if it's on ice stuff, that's it's not you. You are you, and that's the most important thing that, that we, we try to focus on. So we, we do a lot of testing with our guys um, in terms of just classroom work. So when I, when I meet with our guys, we'll go through different assessments. Uh, and at the beginning of the season, we try to take uh, baseline assessments of where they are. Uh, and then throughout the season, look at where they're, where they're at at that point. Uh, if they're in a slump, if they're not doing well, if they're you know, down and out on, on any aspect of the game, the coach could come to us and say, hey, you know, uh, can you meet with this player? You know, we pull their, their, uh, their assessments, look at it, and see where they're at, we're at at the beginning of the season, and then move into you know, where are they now and what are they facing, and what are those strategies that we can implement to help them either get out of that slump or 
you know, move forward with a, with a stronger, uh, stronger strategy. The ability for them to know where they're at and where they're going without having to stop and think about it is, is huge. Uh, the, the reaction time that they have on the ice uh, oftentimes equates to a goal or a no goal, a good pass or a bad pass. Uh, so understanding you know, where they are uh, and giving them strategies to on ice be able to adapt to it is, is massive for these guys. Objectively assessing your own readiness is an impossible task. That is not a thing that can be accomplished. Uh, the science backs up that standing. You need some form of objective measurement that determines that readiness, whether that be reaction time or some other functionality uh, of cognitive testing. Reaction time being the simple one to employ. That's a, a heavy weight that is placed on leaders in the United States military is the responsibility for the lives of the individuals under their command. I am at a place now with the Python technology that I believe that we should no longer accept a knowing fatigue related accident. Like that is not a thing. It's one thing to, to have a mission that requires a substandard rested force to go execute, but to have an accident and kill crew members because we were unclear of their readiness state, because we ha didn't have the technology before, that was, that was an understood thing that could have been a problem, that, that problem set should be erased. We should no longer have that. It, every crew that takes off in the United States military today, there should not be a guess on whether or not they are ready to fly that mission. It should be done. We should be measuring the human being. There are 9,000 different sensors on a helicopter measuring every pressure, temperature, fluctuation about the machine. But the person operating the machine, we have no insights on. And that's absurd. We should absolutely know that the person manipulating the machine is good, is in the middle, or not good. And we should be making decisions based on that information to say that's a pilot that, was, that we, we are going to fly or we're gonna replace, or we're gonna mitigate. There's, there's been several uh, commuter train accidents in the U.S. that were directly related to fatigue where the operator was asleep, uh, taking a 35 mile an hour uh, curve at 80 or something like that and made the train jump off the track. So that's been a common occurrence. Um, the bus industry, right, uh, bus driving industry, um, the question really becomes, how many fatigue related accidents are acceptable in the industry? That's the question. Is it acceptable to have a bus driver fall asleep and kill 44 people? Is that acceptable? I don't think it is. Uh, just like I don't think it's acceptable to have a, a commuter train operator engineer fall asleep at the wheel. Uh, that's, not a, that's not a pointing the finger at the operator. That is at the industry. What are we doing in the industry to correct and prevent and protect the public from that type of activity? Uh, so it's no longer this guesswork of well, my aura ring said I slept great, so I should have a great day today, right? My watch tells me I sleep great all the time. I won't say the brand, but I wear a sleep device. It tells me I sleep great all the time. I know I don't. I've had multiple sleep studies that tell me I don't sleep. So I know this isn't telling me the truth. This test is telling me the truth. As I started to, to transition into Pison and we moved towards the, the brain health and reaction time, it was very clear that there's a, there's a, a clear line between them. Um, and your reaction time has a lot to do with your brain health. Um, and it, to me, it is, it is a way to empower um, the end users to make leader decisions of, you know, your baseline is in the morning, this is where you're at, and then you, you know, blow charges or you have shoulder fired weapons and you spend 12 hours doing it. Why do you need to fire for 12 hours? If it, you're doing damage to your brain after about two hours, why don't you stop? Um, I never really knew that I had TBI. Um, like I said, I, was, I wouldn't say I was misdiagnosed. I also wasn't 100% um, clear with the VA when I was going through my retirement process. Um, I explained I'd been blown up multiple times, um, but they just never put the connection together. 
Um, I didn't talk about my memory loss. Um, I didn't talk about my anxiety. I had depression. Um, there really was no good reason why I would have been depressed, um, why I would have had anxiety issues. I mean, I served in, the, in a pinnacle organization for, for 20 years and never felt any of those emotions. But it took that long for it to build, um, you know, to the point where that's that was my breaking point for my brain. So it's uh, it can end a career really quick if you don't, um, it, one, accept it, TBI is normal, whether it's concussion from sports, whether it's blast um, from the military, whether it's parachute falls from the military, um, it all does damage to your brain. Um, so the best thing you can do is take care of yourself, identify it, fix it, but you need a tool to identify it. Um, and it's common. It's very, very, very common these days. You know, it's interesting. Perhaps the most difficult question I get from investors is, if this is such a great idea and you can do all this stuff, why hasn't someone else done it? Specifically, why hasn't Apple done it? You know, I don't know. It's like, why, why didn't Microsoft do Google? Why didn't AOL do Facebook? For God's sake, how, how did IBM let Microsoft and Intel totally transform the computer industry? You know, sometimes it takes the vision and passion and commitment of entrepreneurs. It's kind of the beauty of American entrepreneurial spirit, right? Dexter and David had a vision. You know, they, they wanted to be able to get neurological information from the wrist. You know, and that's evolved to include neurocognitive data. You know, and a whole new set of applications and use cases that they never dreamed of. But that's the beauty of the whole thing. You know, and here we are. We're ready to go. We're ready to rock and roll. And we're ready to transform society. You know, I'm often reminded of a saying that Yogi Berra once said. He said, baseball is a game that's 90% mental and the other half is physical, right? When we talk about mind-body fitness, we're talking about the balance between sound mind and a sound body. It's genuinely 50-50. At the same time, think about it. Who doesn't use their mind, right? In every walk of life. Obviously, knowledge workers, right? So you're talking about engineers, doctors, lawyers, professors, teachers, and so on. What about kids? What about students? You know, they're constantly dealing with anxiety from the, from the stresses, you know, and the uncertainties in life today, right? So, for that matter, anxiety permeates all society. I mean, knowledge workers, what about factory workers? What about pilots? What about truck drivers? What about heavy equipment operators, right? Those are jobs with issues of life and death, right? What about professional athletes, right? That's the separator about where athletes can get from competitive sports up to, you know, college and professional athletics. So it really permeates all walks of life. That's the reason why we set out to put a chip in every watch.